Welcome to our third Distinctions Digital Roadshow. We're now looking at fellowship, the highest distinction the Royal Photographic Society has to offer. There are 750 fellows in the world and any one of them will tell you it's an honour to have the letters FRPS after your name. So what are we looking for? First thing is we need a body of work that not only complies with the criteria for associate but is also distinctive and distinguished. Now that's difficult to quantify, but I put it this way, we're looking for a submission that stands out, that is clearly all yours, and one that shows a truly personal style. It doesn't have to be unique, of course, most things have been photographed before, but it does need to be your take on a chosen topic. Passion for the subject is often the key to success, a wow factor, if you like. So let's have a look at the criteria then. A submission that demonstrates a distinctive and distinguished body of work. A statement of intent that defines the purpose of the work, identifying its aims and objectives. A cohesive body of work that depicts and communicates the aims and objectives set out in the statement of intent. A body of work that communicates an individual's vision and understanding. The highest level of technical ability, using techniques and photographic practices appropriate to the subject. And finally, an appropriate and high level of understanding of craft and artistic presentation. Well, why don't we start with the applied genre and pick that to pieces and welcome the chair of the applied panel, Trevor Yerbury, IFRPS. Hello, Trevor. Good evening, Peter. I trust you're well. Fine, thank you. And how's Scotland? Um, very mild and very pleasant today. Right, now you heard that description yeah. of fellowship. Uh, anything you'd like to add to that? Well, I think you summed it up beautifully, Peter, as always. Uh, I think what you said was um, it's passion for your work. It's passion for the subject that you're photographing. And it's passion for um, creating a body of work that is both unique, different, unusual. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, it combines all these elements. So just remind us what you need, what you require in the applied genre. Well, the applied genre, unlike the majority of the other genres, um, we are open to all, um, again, both amateur, both professionals, and it covers all bases. So we have people who are, um, last year or the year before, we had um, somebody who put in a panel, a book, in fact, of images he'd photograph of his entire village. Um, so it encompasses all, all areas of photography. And the only issue is, the only uh, criteria is that it has to have an end use. So it could be an exhibition, it could be a book, it could be um, a documentary. It has to have an end, a purpose. But it doesn't have to be high end, presumably. If you're in a, a village and you do a community project leading to a pamphlet, would that do? Absolutely, yes. It, it's, it's the images that matter not how grandiose they may be, it's the images that matter. And Do you think you're tougher on applicants at fellowship level because it's fellowship? Or is it simply a matter of them meeting the criteria? No, I think the basics are they have to meet the criteria. I mean, obviously, when it comes down to things like print quality, Peter, for fellowship, then we are relatively strict on, on you know, print quality and uh, etc. But I think as long as it meets the criteria, then we're open to all, all bodies of work. Well, let's look at a successful fellowship panel in, in the applied genre. It comes from Ronan Tiverney, FRPS. He lives in California and he's a professional photojournalist and he would have loved to be here to talk about his work, but he's been commissioned to photograph the wildfires currently raging in his home state. So here's his uh, statement of intent. American politics and unrest, 2016 to 2020. A series of photojournalistic images Hang on, I've just lost the script for a minute. Um, on a site, taken while on assignment for wire services and media companies. The images cover political moments from the presidential candidacies of Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, as well as of social unrest and protests following the 2016 presidential elections in the US. The protest images include photographs from the Muslim ban Dakota Access Pipeline protests, family separation and detention, 
Students March Against Gun Violence and Black Lives Matter. All the images submitted were captured for the purpose of publication. So Trevor, let's go through these images one by one. Uh, yeah. What struck you about them? I think what struck me and what struck the panel, Peter, was that in fact Ronan has beautifully captured the turmoil that has been evident in American politics for the past four years. Uh, I think uh, we, we particularly were impressed by his use of, of the graphics on the, on the posters, on the banners within the images. Uh, I think he has produced uh, an amazing... This, for instance, I, we all love this image. Apart from the American Make America Great and the Trump, it's the surrounding of the individuals with cameras, with movie cameras, with TV cameras, uh, just showing you the intensity of the event. He really gets in close, doesn't he? Beautifully. I mean, he, he gets in amongst the action, which is what any good photojournalist will do. Uh, and again, here he's beautifully captured this image in front of that poster, which means so much to the individuals concerned. Well, so each, each got a story, haven't they? Well, this one in particular has a great story. I mean, obviously, with current events and what's been going on um, and arrests that are being made, this is obviously very, very current. But what I got out of this was the faces of the two individuals behind the locked gates of their house directly opposite, literally just watching on a very, very good, very intense image. And again, um, you remember the prisoner and, and his one thing was, I am, a no I am a name, not a number. And this, this beautifully encapsulates that, that, that statement, refugees welcome which is how it should be. And it's just his capturing of, not only of the posters, not my president and love Trump hate, um, it, it's the intensity that he's managing to capture on the individual's faces who are protesting, the, the sheer anger and the frustration that they are venting. And he's in close, he's in really close. I mean, you, that, that just says everything you need to know. Uh, and because they were obviously shot for newspapers, the, the posters in the background um, actually tell you all you, that's all the information you need to know is there. And again, the finger pointing, which is great, but what's more interesting are all the mobile phones in the background and then the three policemen standing watching over everybody that's going on. And I, again, I love this, you know, we have the God is love, we have California, we have, you know, the, the couple here in, in the vintage uniform, and yet we have the image of Trump here, the caricature of Trump when he mocked the disabled journalist, which really just says it all. It just says so much. And I just loved, and the panel loved the intensity in this lady's face, the sheer frustration of black power, the, the, the you know, justice for Oscar. I mean, that, that's, this young man sees he sees an image, he sees it, and he captures it. It's being in the right place at the right time. Again, the same for this. But of course, having got there, having got in the right position, he doesn't forget about technical matters either, does he? No, I mean, it's all about right position, right time, having the camera ready and set, um, and just being prepared to, ca and again, here you've got a fabulous image of, you know, protests are one thing, but those who are injured during protest and this young man here covered in blood, um, it's not all good fun protesting, as we've seen. And it's all these young ladies' faces, it's all the frustrations being vented, the anger, the annoyance, it's just, yeah, I mean, he is in so close. He, he, gets, he, he knows what he's looking for. And he knows to capture the signage in the background, the posters, the placards. He knows to capture because they tell the story. They tell the story of what the event is and was, which is great for newspapers and magazines. And a very um, subdued and uh, depressed looking Bernie here. Yeah, and, and I, I, maybe not as, as, as strong as the other, but again, it's a great portrait of Biden. And here we have um, trans lives protest, uh, just great imagery. It tells a lot. And the American flag being held up by a protester or a supporter, we don't know. And the looks again, the, 
the hand out flat to the screen, the, the clenched fists. This, the, the, this young man is, is a very, very capable, uh, a very excellent um, documentary photographer. Um, and let's face it, this panel would not have worked so well in colour, would it? No, it wouldn't. I mean, I, because Ronan shoots this for newspapers particularly, I think um, these would stand out beautifully in newsprint and colour, I think. They, the colour would be so confusing mm -hmm. because there'd be so much colour going on that the story that he's trying to get across to the public would be lost. We should say, of course, that people may say they've seen images like this before, but in RPS distinctions, we do not uh, take that into account. We don't compare anything with other work, other submissions, our own work, or previous panels. It's all about meeting the criteria. Yes. Um, but if, as you said, Trevor, when you look into these images, the more you look in, the more you see of the story. Yes, and I think that's, um, he, he, he must take great credit for actually telling, being able to tell a story with a single image. And I think that's the, the true strength of a good photojournalist. So what words of encouragement would you have for anyone thinking of applying for a fellowship with your panel, the applied? I think the first thing, Peter, would be, um, I mean, I've been doing quite a few of these one-to-one um, -one sessions that the RPS are, are very um, good at running. And I think to get an opinion from whatever panel member or chair would be um, to help guide people in what they want to do and where they want to go and are they at the level that they want to be at or should they be thinking about moving to another level. Well, that was extremely useful advice and thank you very much, Trevor Yerbury, FRPS. We'll come back to you later in the program along with all the other uh, chairs. Let's move on to natural history now. And the acting chair of this panel is Mick Durham, FRPS. Hello, Mick. Good evening, Peter. So, your definition then, sir, please, of natural history. Oh, very wide-reaching. Anything wild. Anything that isn't really con constrained by humans. It can be interacting with humans, but not constrained by humans. So, wild animals, wild plants, wild insects, anything that is out there for us to observe and photograph comes under the scope of natural history. What about in the garden, your own garden? In the garden, well, because we're talking about wild, so cultivated plants are not considered wildlife, but we know that wildlife interacts with humans and it does so in the garden. So birds coming into the garden, butterflies, all of these are naturally occurring and of course make um, a very good subject. So nothing wrong with taking images of wild things within our gardens. But not zoos, for example. But not zoos, of course, because we are talking there about very much constrained creatures, creatures in cages. Anything like that is, is not allowed. And of course, that does include people that have birds of prey, owls. I've even heard of, well, dormice, little um, harvest mice that are kept as, not pets, but constrained. Um, to allow people to go and photograph them, and that isn't allowed in, um, in in natural history. And I should point out that at fellowship, neither is any form of third party set up photograph. We do allow some at the associate level, but not at the fellowship. It's all all the work has got to be done by the photographer. So if you see an eagle catching a fish and you're on a, a workshop uh, with another photographer and it's all been set up for you, that wouldn't do? That, if it's been set up for you, that's the key. If you've actually got somebody else doing your sort of field craft for you and setting it up for you, then that is not considered natural history in terms of a fellowship distinction. Okay, let's have a look at a successful panel. This comes from Lakshita Karunarathna, uh, and I'll read you the statement of intent. Though I have photographed wildlife in many places around the world, <clears throat> no other place amazes me to the extent which the canyon part of the Great Rift Valley does. Home to more than two million animals of various types and sizes, it's a heaven on earth for the wildlife enthusiast. With my portfolio, I intend to demonstrate a vast range of subjects from the vast plains of the Great Rift Valley and their behaviors in high structure monochrome photography. I'm passionate about monochrome 
which I believe is possible to unearth a completely different level of moods and expressions. I used high structuring to increase the details of the subjects and the environment so that it gives an extra strength to the images. This portfolio also reflects different angles of wildlife photography, from ultra close up to portraits to very wide angle shots. So Mick, you also asked for a species list. Why is that? We, we do indeed. Um, what we're looking for is photographers who really connect with the subject matter that they're taking. So we're looking to see if the photographer has spent time understanding, but also learning about the um, subject matter. So has the photographer spent time identifying it, which is of course what the species list is about. And if they've spent time um, identifying it, then they're probably going to have spent time learning about it. And of course this impacts on the photography that they do and brings it to a different level. Well, let's have a look at the images one by one, shall we? Uh, you'd Indeed. have to really understand behaviour to get these sorts of images, wouldn't you? You, you do have to understand behaviour. You have to really know your subject. And um, this photographer, in his statement of intent, has done two things. He's he's at, he's he's really told us about his photographic techniques, but he's also told us about this seeing eye. For this one, it's an abstract image, primarily totally abstract, with that little portion of the image which isn't abstract, the roller, which just gives power to it. He's got a seeing eye. He knows that his subject matter responds well to this, what does he call it? High structuring monochrome. And it does. Look at the quality of the detail in, in these images. It just pulls the, 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 the power of these creatures out onto the onto the photograph and give you something really wonderful to look at. And this one here, not quite breaking the rules, but he's got the adult looking away from the camera slightly, wondering where it's going, but the youngster is engaging. So there's an element there that captures us. But again, look at the quality of the detail, his style. It's, it, this is what this panel is all about. A really particular style, a seeing eye and a style that suits his subject matter. And a beautiful, powerful image of a, um, a male lion, not quite looking at camera again, a little bit disdainful. He's put it into its environment. And again, it just, it just emanates power. And this one, we don't see all of the mother elephant and we've actually got parts of the little one hidden and in shade, but it's telling us the story about how the mother is caring for the youngster. And we see enough of the youngster to, to give us that story. This is real storytelling. And this one, um, a really sort of high key image, hardly any detail in the sky. And sometimes that might be a problem, but not here. We've got all that beautiful bark detail, the um, leopard, its tail and leg hanging down and its, its prey. And it's just speaking volumes as to what this animal is all about and how it lives its life. And this one, we're, we're so used to um, natural history being colourful and vibrant. And these birds are colourful and vibrant, these cranes. But when you bring it down to monochrome, it allows us to see feather detail and, and de other detail that could perhaps get lost if we were um, being bombarded by the, the colours that these animals have. And this one, another storytelling, a lioness pulling a kill down perhaps towards her cubs, perhaps towards other lionesses. The concentration on that face, and again, it's not looking at us, it's looking at the job in hand, but we're looking on and seeing this little scenario in front of us. And this one, um, water buffalo, completely covered in mud, hardly any real detail here compared to some of the others, mm. almost not able to see the eye and the mouth and the nose, but we can see enough. And it's the mud that is telling us the story. Absolutely, the way it's dripping off and just smoothing out the details. And then you go to this one where every 
bit of fur is there, a complete contrast. And look at the concentration. And that one is looking straight down at the camera, which just adds a contrast to the others and, and adds to the power. And here again, another little detail, a giraffe's neck, um, only a partial of the, the, the story, and then the ox pecker, probably picking off little insects off the um, animal there. And that's the little and large, the story of the African um, safari, really. And a, another proud lion, this one staring straight at you, and you, you really can feel the, the power and the arrogance of, of the creature. And another almost um, abstract image, most of it out of focus, but you've got that head shot and the eye, which just pulls you in and you can't escape it. It, it is just such an amazingly powerful image that really makes you concentrate on a tiny element of the, of the zebra. And this one, the mother, slightly away from the cubs, giving them their space, but she's still obviously in control. And look at the cubs' features. They're all alert, even the ones at the back out of focus, you can tell they're alert, and there's a whole life ahead of them. Now this, this one, this is an incredibly powerful. It shows Africa, the, the vast landscape of Africa, the vast skies. We've got three giraffe, the main one, it's not even looking at us, he's walking away. And then the next one on the right, slightly smaller, and then way in the distance, a tiny one. And it just tells you that this is a big, big place. And it just speaks volumes for the whole African um, experience, I think. An amazing picture. And here, very sad in a way, that um, dead creature um, obviously ended its life so that another life can be lived. And again, that's another story that's being told, but with sympathy. Again, almost unable to be certain what that bird is sitting on. I think it's, um, uh, or is it, it's a, <clears throat> let, uh, no, I can't remember what that is, but it's a texture there, tells us that it's a creature. And there's obviously some sort of relationship. It could be that the bird is collecting hair for a nest or something, and probably again, collecting insects off, which gives relief to the animal. And this one, this one, um, a, a prestigious award in nine, uh, 2017, a muddle of <clears throat> lioness um, heads, but everyone telling a slightly different story and the quality there, even the out of focus ones, the ones that are not fully in the frame, just adding to the whole picture that this is a, a family, a, a group of lionesses, and this is how they live their lives. And the quality is, is just absolutely fantastic. And then finally, we've had some fairly dramatic, some fairly grim images with dead creatures. A lovely tender moment to finish with. The two elephants, just that engaging element where they're obviously communicating with each other. A lovely soft foreground and background. A beautiful way to finish what is a stunningly produced um, panel. Now, of course, this was a resubmission. Perhaps you could explain what that is. Yeah, uh, um, if a panel comes up for um, assessment and the, 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 the um, assessors feel that maybe one or two images are just not quite up to standard, it might be that they feel that the pictorial content isn't quite as strong, or it could be perhaps that um, for a print submission, the, the print quality isn't quite good enough. Um, if it's only one or two images, then the panel will recommend that this person goes away and reviews the panel and perhaps does something with the one or two images that um, have been picked up on. So a print one, it would be a case of reprinting to um, get rid of the print problem. If it was a picture that they felt wasn't quite strong enough, 
then obviously the person would be advised to go and look at other images and find one that was, he felt, up to standard that fitted the panel. And it would come back to us as this one did. And in this case, it was um, accepted. So what have we learned then by watching this panel then, Mick? We've learned black and white can be extremely powerful, even if you prefer colour. And that it really is all about storytelling, as with the applied panel. It is. It's about storytelling. It's about seeing eye. It's about knowing your creatures. And, and that choice of monochrome was a, a, a knowledge-based decision that this person knew that the monochrome style that he'd got in his mind would work in these situations. I'm sure he took lots of other pictures when he was in Africa that wouldn't have worked or weren't as strong as a monochrome image and obviously didn't make the panel. Well, Mick, we've learned a lot. So thank you very much indeed, Mick Durham. We'll come back to you at the end as well. My pleasure. Thank you. So we're now going to move to fine art, very popular within the Royal Photographic Society and outside, of course. And the chair of our fine art panel is Sue Brown, FRPS. Good evening, Sue. Good evening, Peter. <laughs> so tell us, what do we actually mean by fine art? Because I've heard it interpreted and defined in many different ways. That's probably because there are many different ways of showing it. Um, it's a way that the photographer can shine really because we have no restrictions on the subject matter, the technique, although it is advisable to perhaps avoid stereotypical images. Communication is important. We need to see the author's individual understanding and the body of work must look as if it's being produced by the, the one author. So any amount of manipulation is acceptable as long as it doesn't detract from the image, the subject matter. That's right. And as long as it's appropriate to the subject matter as well, we'll, we'll have anything. <laughs> so you're saying you've got to feel something looking at the images? Yes, we need to have a sense of design, some emotion, mood or a meaning which encourages the panel to look beyond the main subject. So we're still looking for that passion in photography but it knows no boundaries. The author is able to do as they wish, as long as it communicates to us the statement of intent that is so important as in any genre. Okay, well, let's have a look at a successful Fine Art Fellowship panel now. Uh, this one was put together by John Miskelly, FRPS. And as we look at the hanging plan, I'll read the statement of intent. This panel is an exploration of time using very long exposures, ranging from two minutes in duration to eight minutes or even longer, aimed at giving a sense of time passing, whether that be in the movement of the clouds across the sky or the smoothing of the water. I'm constantly looking for potential shapes or patterns that attract me, and I'm strongly influenced by simple yet strong compositional elements, which are often about the connections and relationships between the natural elements around our coastline, but often including elements created by man. Add to this the atmosphere, light, weather, and movement that I'm drawn to, and you start to get the essence of my personal style. I've chosen to work in color, where my intention is to show a muted palette, most commonly found in the soft light at the beginning and end of the day. And so as we go through the images, it is soft, isn't it? It is muted. Lovely images. It is indeed, especially after the excitement we've just had. This brings us down to something really peaceful, gentle, lovely muted colours and a lot of um, graphic design which you would normally perhaps associate with architecture but here it is architecture in that you've got the man-made structures in the images but by wiping out the water um, to make it completely abstract it gives you more strength to the abs to the actual graphic image. And here you have clouds scudding across the sky and this slightly submerged, it looks like a wartime bunker, something that you often get on the coast of France and some other places. And then just the sand bank at the front there. And as you look at them, uh, there's no question of repetition here, is there? They're all, they're all different. Oh, absolutely and they've all got a different mood to them. I mean, this one here, you've got this lovely sand, that sort of, you can see the wind almost blowing the sand in that. And then you've got the cloud coming over the land mass in the beginning. 
and then the other land here. So it's a sort of contained waterway there, and a lovely atmosphere to it with the detail in the sand. And here we've got some more natural structures, the rocks going out into the sea. And sometimes you get these lovely mountains or hills in the background and then going out into the open sea. And again, the clouds scudding across the sky, giving the movement of the wind that's obviously there. And again, natural structures and the lovely circles there. And because of the long shutter speed, you can see them underwater as well. Something that you don't see with the human eye when you're looking at water, you only see what's above the surface. But doing this sort of technique, you see what's below. And a lovely image here with this line taking you in and round and the light coming all the way round to meet the land mass on the opposite side and the mountains in the distance. And again, you've got the detail in the grains of sand there and then the sort of muddied waters on the left. Lovely image. And here you've got the man-made structures of the uh, defences there with the sand that you can see through the water. Again, the reflections and stopped by the um, horizon going across and giving you that dark, dark sea on the skyline and then the sky, the sky coming towards you, the wind blowing this way. And a lovely image here with the, um, the pier going across and then balanced with this little bit of negative space here. And then you've got this other structure. And again, the sky is going across and such lovely gentle tones. It's very restful. And then we have the curve here. And the one thing I enjoy about a lot of these long exposures is when you get the lack of horizon. Because when you've got um, a structure like that, which has that lovely graphic design, if you had a really strong horizon going across, as you get sometimes, it can perhaps detract from the, that nice curve that you've got, and it can just sometimes spoil it. Whereas here, you've got a very strong design in the bottom, so the graphic line going across for the horizon um, doesn't detract from it at all. And the fact that it's parallel with the top of the structure also helps in its design. And the lovely fishing nets you often get on the Gironde and other places in France, lovely structures. And again, the lovely lighting on this where you've got the um, reflection with a bit of colour in and the, where the net is actually anchored there with the line going across. Very nice image and you can see some nice darkness in the sky there. Obviously quite a stormy sort of day. And this lovely big zigzag hefty looking structure in such a delicate image with the lovely pinks in the sky. The contrast between the strength of that structure and the gentleness of the tones and the pinks in the sky I think is really quite delightful. And it looks like somewhere that somebody might live with the boat anchored off it. And again, the nice, soft, gentle tones. And you can see the movement in the boat there. The boat has lost its sharpness moving on the water. And you've got the uh, reflection again from the building on the right hand side. A lovely bridge going across the architecture as well. So again, it's the graphic design. And even against the whitest part of the skies, you can still see those supports of the bridge coming down and taking you right the way round and getting smaller and smaller as it leads you out of the picture, actually sitting on the horizon. And again, no horizon to fight with here. Here you've got all sorts of angles coming in and sometimes the angles, it makes the picture look as if it's not quite straight when you've got the horizon but it's disappeared and a lovely reflection and a rather broken down structure and the lovely soft sky, often vignetted slightly just to hold the images in. And again, somewhere that somebody probably lives, um, very remote and it gives you the feeling of being somewhere overseas, perhaps, I don't know where, but lovely, soft and gentle and just a very relaxing picture. Much busier here, 
probably somewhere like oyster beds and fishing stakes and so on. And then this lovely curved walkway going out, taking you out to the end of the pier. And the lovely mood of the sky, again with the sky clouds going across and the sea completely wiped out. The exposures can be quite different, difficult on pictures like this because as John said, he's often working in the morning and in the evening. And when you're working at these times, the light is changing. In the morning, it's obviously getting brighter and brighter. And in the evening, it's getting darker. And you have to try and balance that against trying to get the right exposure because the innate, an innate minute exposure, um, the light has changed considerably. And a lovely gentle image here with just that bit of color on the um, pier at lighthouse at the end there and a hefty structure, and then the land delicately coming across the horizon at the back. Well, we see a reasonable amount of panels like this, don't we, featuring long exposure images at the seaside. For you, what makes this one stand out? I think it's the delicateness of the colours that have been brought together so well, and the, the structures are quite different. There are one or two that we see quite often, but they've deemed to have been displayed in John's own way with that nice delicacy and the, that slight colour, almost monochromatic but not quite. Well I'm delighted to say John Muskelly is now with us. John Muskelly, FRPS from Northern Ireland, how are you? I'm great Peter, how are you? Fine, thank you. I think Sue Brown wants one of yours on her wall. That's easy to sort. She must be a bit of a fan. Uh, but she must be delighted though to have got this fellowship. A lot of work in there. Yes, absolutely delighted. As you said at the start, Peter, it's such an honour to achieve a fellowship with the with the Royal. I think it's uh, the pinnacle for any of us who are photographers that like working with bodies of work is to achieve the, the highest award possible. So it's uh, it's something I'm very proud of and I thoroughly enjoyed the process. Well, tell us how you began all this and the gestation period afterwards. Well, I really started taking landscapes around about 2007. Prior to that, I was more a travel photographer. And uh, I specialized actually in panoramas. And I did long exposure panoramas for, for a number of years. And it was around about 2015. I started to experiment more with the square format and, and longer exposures again. Prior to that, I was probably working at you know, 30 seconds or one or two minutes. And I moved increasingly to some of those images were 12 and 14 minutes long. Uh, so that was about 2015. And I took the last images in the panel in 2018. So it was a four year period. And then the work started in terms of trying to pull it together as a panel. Uh, and that sort of happened over about a six or a nine month period before I submitted it in 2019 last year. How did you manage to get this consistent look the feel, the tone, it's, it's really obviously the work of one photographer. Was that difficult to achieve? Yeah, because you're working out in the landscape and, and light can be quite different. And, and you said, and, and Susan kindly said as well about the soft, delicate tones. So I was looking for a certain type of light. Some days I would be out and it would be you know, very stormy and dramatic and it gives a very different look to the image. And while I still like taking images like that, for the panel, I was looking for a certain feel that I'm attracted to. And I, I went out of my way to do that. One of the images, the very first image in the panel top left, uh, was one that I waited 10 days for the light to be uh, quite right while I was in holiday with my wife in the Channel Islands. And it was the only day in 2018 in that wonderful summer uh, where we had a little bit of cloud and a high tide at the same time. Uh, so my wife uh, very conveniently went off to a choral concert while I went off to get the final, the final shot for the panel, which I was deliberately looking for. I'd been there before and hadn't got it. And as anybody that does landscapes knows, you have to keep going back quite often to the same location uh, to, to find just what you want. Mm -hmm. So you had to work hard at this, but having got the images, how hard did you have to work to work out an order, hanging plan? Yeah, that's, that's probably the hardest bit uh, of, of all for him to just pull the panel together. Uh, and I think I had as many as about 17 different uh, combinations of, of layouts. Uh, probably about 35 to 40 images were in the final shortlist. 
and I shuffled them around and I also had them in layers in Photoshop. And I took some advice, obviously, from, from a few other people uh, who are also fellows uh, as to what they thought. But ultimately, it was my panel, so I had to make those decisions. And I spent a lot of time trying to balance horizons and tones and this shape of the different structures in, in the images. So I did spend a lot of time trying to get the panel to work in a, in a balanced way. And I have to say, I thoroughly enjoyed that process. You got there in the end, powerful motivation over several years, but now you've got it. So mm. what next? Next, well, I'm, I'm currently working on a, on a, a slightly different project. It's still around the coastline, uh, which is where I'm drawn to, but this time I'm actually working much more just with the water itself. So I'm doing some intentional camera movement with waves and, and water and tones. But I've also just ordered a waterproof housing for my camera, which is literally on its way from Australia, thanks to uh, DHL. And that should be with me next week. And my intention is actually to be in the water uh, and try to shoot your know, shots from within the water. They're not going to be long exposures for obvious reasons, but hopefully I'll get a different feel and something you know, quite unusual. Uh, so uh, the, the, the winter is uh, maybe not the best time to be doing it, but also it's the most interesting time from a light and, and water movement point of view. So hopefully I'll get something good. Well, we look forward to seeing the outcome of your endeavours. And thank you, John Miskelly and Sue Brown. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, Peter. OK, let's move on to documentary now. And the chair of the documentary panel is Simon Leach, FRPS, come in South Wales. Hello, Simon. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Now, we've heard what other people want, what they're looking for. What about you? At fellowship level, what are you looking for in documentary? So, documentary, we're looking for photography which communicates a clear narrative through visual literacy. So, you're telling us something, whether it's an emotion or whether it's a story, it's got to be about that message. It's what you're photographing, it's why you're photographing, but most importantly, what you want the viewer to take away, having seen your body of work. We've heard from previous chairs that they want the images to tell a story, to communicate it to the viewer. Um, has it got to be obvious, more obvious in documentary? I think, well, photography is a visual communication medium, isn't it? So it's always about what you're trying to impart to the viewer. But I think the difference with documentary is trying to thread the, together those pieces of the story. Each image tells you something. It's a bit like chapters in a novel or, or tracks on an album, uh, for those sort of that are old enough to remember vinyl. Um, so, yeah, threading that together, making each image speak, but also then getting that whole story through a body of work is really key in documentary genre. So if you've been led down the right path, as it were, by the statement of intent, you then look at the images, each one has a story, together they add up to the overall narrative. Yes, definitely. The statement of intent is definitely there to introduce what we would call the aims and objectives. So again, it's, it's that, you know, you can explain what you're photographing, but really we want to know why and what you're hoping for us to take away. Not to tell us in too much detail, but give us that hint, give us that introduction so that right. we know where we're aiming at. Let's put it into practice then and see a panel. This one is from Andre Duplessis, FRPS, originally entered under the applied genre because at that time it covered documentary work. But now, of course, we have Simon's quite separate distinctions panel. Uh, so here is Andre's statement of intent. I usually select a house at random, never knowing who will open the door or what awaits me once inside. However, when I leave that dwelling after an hour, we have turned from strangers to friends. Their pride, hospitality, cooperation and respect seem so incongruous with what the eyes of the more privileged see or want to see, defining qualities that are often invisible to the outsider. These brief and impromptu encounters always leave me filled with awe and admiration and assist me to maintain a uniquely optimistic perspective on life. This panel will form part of a collection of images for publication in a book that is intended to raise awareness of the challenging conditions that many souls in South Africa still live in. So Simon, let's have a look at the images and what do you think of them? I think it's a stunning panel. I mean, the statement of intent has introduced what Andre's trying to do. Obviously that last line does lead 
towards the applied, which is where this panel was originally successful. But you can see from the images straight away, we're talking about people, we're talking about the environments that they live in, that kettle in the background there. Beautifully seen, just the com composition of the image, the spacing of it is really nicely done. Anybody who's on, not on a calibrated system this evening, if you're watching it on an iPad or something, trust me, the shadow control that Andre has got within this body of work is something that you really need to, trust me, it's there. All the details in the shadows, look under the, the tabletops and the uh, work surfaces here. Again, a really cheerful face, but not perhaps where we'd expect to be preparing produce or food. It looks like this might be somebody's kitchen. So we're already getting into a theme here, but it's really a panel about the engagement of the people. This image is stunning. That eye, the one eye of the girl in the front, confidence in that stare, and then stepping back using depth of field so that we can get a hint of the characters and the faces of people behind, but it's not detracting from that character. You keep bouncing back and forth one to the other. Keep coming back to the young lady at the front and that, that engagement with beautiful it's all about support you know we we talk about family we've talked about it a lot this year people talk about relationships and things like that again the control of the shadows getting a very cohesive body of work together but keeping to focus on those aims and objectives within the statement of intent and building up something already that is quite distinctively the work of andre and, and one individual photography again engagement with the individual the support of the doll for the child. She looks nervous. She looks slightly uncomfortable at the photograph. The surroundings, not unkempt in any way, but very minimal. Nothing that we would perhaps think of as luxurious. And that's what this story is about. People and where they live and how they live. Image that sticks with me. Love this one. Child number two from the left, obviously in a little bit of trouble. Child number three, absolutely defiant, um, possibly a little school party or something like that. But note the framework of, in the window there, that wire framing just gives you a hint to the kind of conditions we're talking about. And of course, the child on the right, right hand side of the frame actually is, is in bare feet as well. So you're getting these little hints all the time about the hope and about the character of the people but also about the condition of living and the lifestyle that they're, they're leading. Character again. Interestingly, a technique that Andre's used before, single eye. Very different portrait, slightly subdued, slightly uh, cautious or wary perhaps of the photographer. But again, <clears throat> attention to detail in the shadow areas and the focus so you can get that texture of the wall behind and start to learn something about the environment this young lady there. Slightly unnerving portrait, I find this one. Uh, there's something not quite comfortable about the couple and where they're positioned. But you've got this room, quite cramped, quite cluttered with the environment, but then the shadow at the window. Those that don't notice it looks the round side of frame, there, there appears to be a person stood behind the window just adds a question mark, adds that kind of mystery of what is that person? Is that the reason this is uncomfortable portrait? Because they're being watched over. And then we're back to the characters again. Lovely little boy here, such confidence, such a cheeky face, and of course the terrier in the background escaping. But again, something of the environment, that basic, clean, but, but basic living that we're talking about within these images. Really strong portrait. Think about the design of the panel. This portrait's on a corner, it's looking in again. Strength, confidence, that defiance in that portrait, very strong. And the texture coming through on the vest and in the shadow areas of the skin, beautifully handled. Very competent photographer here dealing with this. these quite difficult, I would imagine, lighting. But we'll notice nothing in the statement of intent that talks about challenges or, or any of that sort of thing. Again, image, statement of intent, all in one image here, 
this little boy looks out over this landscape every day. You can picture the face, you can picture the scene, you know what we're talking about just from this one image. Very key within the statement of intent and within the body of work. But again, beautifully handled in quite contrasty long lighting pictures. So much to see in here. That concern perhaps of a mother or an aunt or somebody, but the person in the background is obviously younger, has a disability. How are they going to cope? How are they going to get through the situation? Very interesting, very telling shot and really quite humbling shot. Just lovely. You know, the, the rooms that we're looking into, child almost slightly reticent to, to give you that glimpse into their room and the, the, the fabrication of it and the bits that are hanging around and the texture of the wall. So they are slightly subdued, some of these, but it's the detail and that consistency all the way through on the way the shots have been handled and the way the process has been handled on right the way through to the print. Support, again, we're talking about family or, or a relationship here. And personally, my eye goes to the lady on the right, half in shadow, slightly further back in the frame, but creates this really interesting balance within the image just holds your attention and at fellowship level that's what you want to do you want to hold somebody's attention and they can read more into the images as you want them to to read this is how you control the, the, the viewer your viewer and get that message across to them. little details like this you know again quite a nice portrait on the face of it and then you look in the mirror there's the child in the background the crack across the mirror again very bland surroundings not much in the room. Can't see it because the crop's so tight, but very clever use of that mirror to show the emptiness of the room around as well. So the composition is, is beautifully handled, as well as the processing. An image that sticks with me from the panel. This almost pride, the hope for the child. I'm assuming this might be the mother. Looking forward, again, this confidence. Nobody's looking depressed or down or you know the, the mostly there is concerns obviously but mainly it's as Andre said there is a strength here within these homes and within these families and there is also a trust here you know the trust that, that Andre's building up there's obviously some time and effort and passion behind the panel again the image that sticks with me the lady in the background looks quite relaxed quite at ease quite happy and yet the gentleman in the foreground is concerned and I'm reading into that, you know, is it, is it some kind of relationship there? Is he shielding her from some of the concerns of, of the lifestyle or the environment they're in? Who knows? But you read these things in and there's a story here about the spaces. Again, it's a very bland space, not much going on, but people still tidy in and not unkempt. And you have the friendships and the smile, lovely smile here, lovely mm -hmm. portrait with her trust friend the dog and the the surrounding you know you look at the the way that andre has posed the image with those bits on the shelves the bit of bed showing the uh, the bare wooden walls behind speaks volumes all the time but there's hope there's a smile wonderful lights up the room all the time just coming through you know teenager possibly early 20s who knows but it's that that youth and that exuberance comes right out of the image and yet if you look in the background andres i presume very very intently left in that bit of tarpaulin that makes up the ceiling texture of the walls that are very rough and ready those few bits of cut out that form the pictures and the, what would be the posters I guess on a on a western bedroom wall of a teenager but it gives you that insight into what this lifestyle is you know very happy person despite their surroundings and then finishing with this beautifully controlled portrait very dark setting lovely retention of detail in the shadow but that look again it's all about that engagement and that trust with the photographer of She's nervous, she's, she's 
concerned, she's wary, something, but still allowing the photographer to, to interact with them and take these portraits. Something, a whole panel that's taken a lot of passion and a lot of access, which is really important, as we've already heard throughout the other genres. And of course, uh, Andre is now a Distinctions panel member with us, Simon. And uh, I know you've got a, uh, an assessment coming up in November, so hopefully you'll come back soon with a new fellowship panel. Yes, yes, but we look forward okay. to it. I think you know we've got some good ones on the horizon from the Zoom one-to-ones we've been doing. So uh, yes. Best of all, luck to all of those coming to us in November and hopefully uh, we'll be uh, giving you some good news. Thank you very much for your interpretation of those very interesting images for Andre de Plessis. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to travel. And we're now joined by the much traveled Hazel Mason, FRPS, chair of the travel panel. Hello, Hazel. Good evening, uh, Peter, how are you? Fine, thank you. Now, you know, as well as I do, everybody takes travel images these days. Uh, they've all got mobile phones. We see them on social media every day. Um, but it's not that sort of photography you're looking for at fellowship level, is it? No, no. With the travel panel, we're looking for a sense of place which covers a, a multitude of different subjects, as, um, as is outlined in the criteria. However, um, for fellowship, we're looking for something a little bit more. We're looking for somebody who understands that subject. And we've heard the words before, passion, hard work, commitment. All of those are needed in the travel panel to give that sense of place. Um, it's, it's very hard to achieve that in a single trip, to get that level of understanding of the culture, of the lighting of a country that you're visiting, um, to have that unique approach as a, as a photographer with a unique take on that, um, that situation. And you got your fellowship in travel. Was I that did. Easy? No. No, I, it's, um, I think anyone would say a fellowship is not easy and that's what makes it such an honour to be awarded the fellowship. Um, it was a challenge, it was a huge achievement, uh, a bigger achievement than a number of my other qualifications, I must say. It's such an honour and I didn't succeed the first time um, and I think that was important, taking the time, finding a passion, finding something you enjoy, going back and back and back and the project comes. And for me, the project is ongoing. It's not just a, a body of work for a fellowship. It's an ongoing project and an ongoing understanding of, uh, of that country. OK, well, let's see a successful panel now. It comes from Max Robinson, FRPS. I'll read you the statement. I've extensively photographed many different families of the Hama tribe of Ethiopia during the past 14 years, recording aspects of their daily lifestyle, including food preparation, collecting firewood, plowing, raising animals, grooming, and scaring birds away from their crops. Additionally, through a long relationship with one particular family, I was able to record key stages of the Hammer Manhood Ceremony, including capturing a bull, preparing the special hairstyle of the initiate by his closest friend, preparing and applying face paint and the circle of close friends for the fertility ritual. Finally, the initiate runs naked across the backs of several bulls, followed by celebratory dancing. For reasons of authenticity, all pieces of dust, straw, scars, etc., on skin have not been retouched. Well, Hazel, as we go through these images, um, a lot of work has gone into these. A huge amount of work has gone into these and it's a, it's a great honour to be able to discuss this panel of Max's which is an outstanding body of work and clearly the body of work of a, a single photographer who understands the culture in Ethiopia. I think two of the critical things here that were in the statement was that a 14 year relationship with this country and long relationships with the family that he was going to photograph in the festival, which allowed him to get those more intimate moments that we're seeing here. Those fly on the wall moments, uh, which means that the people are happy with him taking their photograph. They're aware he's there, they're accepting of him. They're not interacting with him as a photographer. He understands that culture. Um, what each image is showing is that um, Max has used different viewpoints and, and in particular for me, different lighting conditions. Um, this one in particular, he's looking up at this lady, the sense of pride that she's got in her, um, it, in her environment, good control of the blacks and the whites in that image. Um, people know how difficult it is to photograph in these bright lights, but Max, as we've seen in the other fellowship panels, has demonstrated 
superb control of highlight and shadow detail in what is extremely challenging light. A lot of use of backlighting to reflect um, his subjects. And each, for me, each image is communicating a story. Each image is telling us something about that, um, that country, those villages, those people. And the more you look, the more you see, which I think is again, part of a fellowship. It's that communication of the story. Um, the more an image holds your attention, the stronger that image is going to be. And each of these individual stories are joining together to form a, a collective narrative, giving us a picture of what Ethiopia is like for this tribe and how they would celebrate um, during, the, during the rituals. And overall, the, the individual images add together to give us a, a stronger body of work. The next few images are the ones that Max talked about in his um, relationship with one family during the festival. Um, a great honour to be a part of that festival and to share that festival. And um, Max said he'd been um, visiting his family many times and this certainly shows through in these images. It's very hard to take a panel just of a festival because often the actual festival itself takes place in bright times of day. Uh, but what Max has done here is he's gone in at different times of day, preparations for the festival. Those are critical. This is catching the ball that's going to be used, um, that the boy is going to run across. A great viewpoint straight into the camera, catching that uh, young man just as he's about to, to jump the final balls. And looking around the photograph, the, the, the members of the tribe all there celebrating that success. Here, a different viewpoint, um, close in. He's certainly engaging with this family to show this part of the fertility ritual. A great honor to be allowed to be part of this tribe and only, um, only that kind of situation that you would get by repeated visits and trust. They're not aware of him as a photographer, they're carrying on with what they're doing. This is showing us a different facet. Um, again, taking the brighter times of day, but showing great control of the lighting and catching that moment in the whipping ceremony when the girls are being, are being whipped um, before, the, uh, before the bull jumping part of the ceremony. The dancing, again, bright lights, well controlled, people just carrying on um, with their celebrations. Max is clearly close in there um, to get that viewpoint, sort of looking up and uh, capturing that um, vibrancy. And this is a much more intimate portrait again, again, um, the, the, the tribal people applying the face decoration here, showing that understanding, that time spent with them, watching the preparations rather than just going in there, taking photographs and leaving. Um, it shows he's trusted as part of their community for this. And it shows that he understands the behavior and what to expect. Um, this again, difficult lighting, the use of backlighting to capture this moment, the use of the dust there, um, a very powerful image moving away from the festival and showing us um, mm. much more the way of life again, a pictorially very strong image. An image, again, more intimate. How often do you see children engaging with a photographer in these countries? These children are with their mum, they're preparing the food, they're ignoring Max. He's obviously been spending time in that village and uh, is accepted. Um, he's that fly on the wall, that documentary type approach to produce a picture and an image of what is taking place. Again, difficult lighting, bringing the, bringing the oxen back, um, telling stories, looking around the image, those dark shadows and those bright highlights, but retaining all the detail. This next image, again, in there close, the ploughing, um, a different viewpoint showing us the wider scene, capturing that moment um, of them ploughing with the, with the oxen there, a different facet of life, showing an understanding of that, um, of that community. And here we have an indoor shot, wide angle lens, the family are obviously cooking there, and again, just going about their day-to-day -day activities. The photographer just watching and observing an intimate moment. How often do you see children engaging with the photographer? Here, this child is um, obviously watching something else, resting his head on the, um, on the water bottle, the plastic bottle, um, completely oblivious to Max's present there. And then finally, this was the last image of Max's panel, a very fitting image, um, a very, very pictorial image, a very dynamic image um, of this lady standing on her, um, in her field, um, ending the panel, a beautiful body of work.
Okay, well, I'm delighted to say that we won't ignore Max Robinson, FRPS, because he can join us now from Switzerland. Hello, Max. Yeah. Good, good evening, and thank you very much for your kind remarks, Hazel. Very, very appreciate it. Good evening, Peter. No problem, Max. Congratulations. Now, tell us, we know this took you 14 years altogether, but how did you go about compiling the panel? Well, I, I, I initially failed at my attempt at this portfolio. I think it's fair to be candid because I, I initially just tried to create a portfolio around this manhood ceremony. And as I put it together, I just realized, I, I kind of realized uh, in retrospect that I was trying to narrow, I was painting myself into a corner. Um, it, was, it, was too, it was too difficult to get a set of images that were really, really right. And it was only when I opened my mind to why don't I show a lot more of the aspects of the life of the Hammer tribe, which I've taken on many occasions, and integrate into that panel the, um, the actual ceremony. And that way, it really worked. How many images do you think you took over those years? Thousands, thousands. I, I, I really don't know. Um, I mean, I, I do try to be, I do try to be very accurate when I take my photos. I mean, I come from the, from the school of photographer who went out with a roll of 12, 12 shots in my camera and I was making everyone count. I still try to make everyone count, but I've just, when I say thousands, that's also covering literally hundreds of people, you know, many different terrains, villages, markets. Uh, now, we've heard what Hazel said about earning the trust of the Hammer people, which you clearly did. Was that difficult? Well, it's, it's important to have somebody, when, when you're talking about a tribe which doesn't even speak the national language of the country, you know, it's, it's spoken by a relatively small number of people, it's important that you have a guide who, who can work with you so that they, they basically help you gain the trust. And, and you can do it through gestures. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of back and forth about what is your life like? What, what, what does your family do? How do you live? And so a lot of it actually is just done without a camera. It's just sitting around talking to people through the interpreter and, and your body language says, it, says everything. You know, if you feel that you're open, you smile, um, you're, you're relaxed in that company. Body language is, is 90% of it. What did they make of this white guys come all the way from Switzerland to take their images? That's well, bizarre. Well, yeah, I mean, a, a, lot of, a lot of the tribes of the Omo Valley in the south of Ethiopia are used to seeing tourists, uh, but this particular village was just way, way off the beaten track. I mean, they very, re very rarely get to see people um, from outside and you know, in fact, for example, when we were there, there was somebody who, who got sick, they had an infection. Unfortunately, we had some antibiotics from them, but otherwise it would have been a two days walk to the, to the doctor. So that was really how far away we were from, from civilization. And once you had the images in, how difficult was it to sort out a, a submission, get them in an order? I think once they were there, I, I really tried to settle on themes. So. I knew that there were many <coughs> subjects to cover those like the, the face paint use the ones from that ceremony, but all of the other aspects. So I went to images that were in those different categories and I figured which would look best. And I, I did initially try looking at this in color, um, but I, I just found that it was, so, the impact was so much more powerful, um, really when you concentrate on, on the tone of, of people's skins, their, their bodies. Well, there's clearly no stopping you. You've got a, a fellowship in travel, a fellowship in multimedia, and you're now chair of the film panel. What's happening with the film panel? Well, the, the film panel is, um, is, is really kicking off now in a very positive way. We had the um, first set of entries for film uh, during, during um, August, and we're, we're now in the process of consolidating them, and we're going to be going to the distinctions panel for film uh, for their assessment in, in the coming days. And we've got some amazing entries, really. Um, we've got some at licentiate level, uh, associate level, and all the way up to fellowship level. And I, I really hope that we can get those on, on the website after, after we have the results. They're, they're, they're really superb. Well, Max Robinson, best of luck with that. And thank you also to Hazel Mason, chair of the travel panel. Thank you both. You're a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks very uh, we'll be opening up the chat line for questions soon. So if you'd like to ask questions about anything you like, 
anything about the panels or distinctions in general, please now type into the chat bubble at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but for our last area, we're looking at contemporary, the contemporary genre. And the acting chair of the contemporary panel is Richard Brayshaw, FRPS. Hello, Richard. Hello, Peter. Good evening. Good evening to you. Now, in a way, you've got the broadest canvas, haven't you? Because you never know what ideas people are going to come up with when they submit a contemporary panel. Yes, exactly. Um, and in that sense, it means there are no rules that we can say you always do this or you always do that because the scope, as you say, is huge. It's, it starts with a thought, an idea people want to say something about. But the scope, I, I've written a few down, just examples, social, philosophical, economical. Um, it could be a massive issue. It could be a tiny local issue. It could be a psychological exploration, as we will see shortly. Um, so there is many opportunities. Um, but also with contemporary, you find that sometimes the subjects are tools for expressing the idea. So the subjects are potentially used in a different way. So fascinating. So the, sta the statement has to be sort of married to the images, um, presumably particularly in contemporary. But why don't we have a look at one now? Uh, this successful panel came from Elizabeth Cowell, FRPS. And here's her statement of intent. <clears throat> it starts with a quote. Behind every mask, there is a face. And behind that, a story. Marty Rubin. Based on the iceberg model by Goodman, 2002, an extension of Sigmund Freud's conscious and unconscious theory. People may expose only a small part of their true self, the visible tip of the iceberg, but what characterizes us is hidden below the surface, submerged part of the iceberg. Through my panel, I wanted to depict the different facade of our true self with the metaphorical staging of masks. Do we embrace our uniqueness, insecurities, personal and intimate orientations, addictions, mental status, vitus, vices, and physical traits? Or do we hide or pretend to hide them to protect our authentic self so we can socially be accepted or fit into conventionalism? As William models, I reached out to my fellow work colleagues, past and present, who I know well in their professional life. These included medical practitioners, healthcare and administrative staff, and others who have now changed their profession over the years. Through pictorial documentation, I've attempted to explore, reach and uncover their inner complexities, trying to remove their barriers and pretenses and expose their true selves. Their stories and revelations were genuine. Some were understated and subtle, some extreme, dark and complex, others affected by accidental circumstances. But not all could entirely expose or banish their entrapments. Amongst my panel is a self-portrait, as I felt it was important to also remove my mask to gain my colleagues' confidence and support. So Richard, let's have a look at the images. Very interesting. What do you make of them? Yes, a fascinating panel. Um, the statement is complex um, and this in image gives a very good introduction because you've got the two faces looking in opposite directions and yet the hands holding the mask connect the two. So a very good way of starting. And here we've gone deeper into the idea of looking behind because you've got a slightly gruesome um, structure of a face with that jaw. Um, and again, a very complex image with lots of thought provoking things going on. So we're getting deeper into the ideas expressed in the statement. Um, again, this, it, there's a screen here, there's a mask, um, which um, applies in a lot of the images um, and the, the stripes across the top highlight the eyes, which um, was a very clever use of the manipulation. And here, maybe this is one of those where they weren't revealing so much of themselves because there aren't so many clues in this image as to what the issue might be. Very powerful image, um, the shaft of light carefully positioned to highlight that pill um, between the teeth, um, which gives you all sorts of scope for thought and engagement with the image. And here again, we have a screen which hides part of the face. We can see some of it. Um, 
it's it's a quite a graphic image which characterizes the whole panel with strong black and white images with a very um, well controlled use of light. Again, the, the strong graphic image, very clever because we've got a mask at the back of a head. We've got two people, um, which gives us lots of clues to engage with the image again and think about um, what the issues might be. Here again, the clever use of that arm to hide part of the face gives us that two level view of the subject. You've got one eye you can see clearly and one side of the face is, is slightly masked. So again, it completely reinforces and works on what the statement says. And again, this is more of a bland image. Of, I, I don't mean that pejoratively, but um, it doesn't have quite the same graphic quality, but it brings out the expression and the body language, which again leads you into a um, thought process about what's going on here. And this, we're now well into the panel, um, and, and this creates another whole level of what's happening. It's a very clever use of manipulation, but by the time we're now completely engrossed in this panel, we're not looking at it thinking, gosh, that's clever Photoshop. We're asking ourselves, what's going on and why? What is the particular issue here? And here again, um, two sides of a picture, the left-hand side quite slightly lacking in contrast, one reality of the marriage, the other side, um, a bruise, a separate eye, and a jagged line down the middle to create that dilemma. And here again, we've got a screens and we've got barriers and barbed wire, perfect example of shielding yourself behind something. So again, it's a very interesting graphic image which relates very well to the ideas expressed in the, in the statement. Very powerful image. Um, lots to do with children, potentially, there's a doll. Again, there's a lot to look at and think about in this image in relation to the statement. We've got a, a religious setting here, which um, obviously relates to what is happening. The barbed wire on the head um, gives you a clue about some of the issues that might be going on. There are tears on one side of the picture. Um, but again, very clever use of the lighting and control of the situation. So the technicalities in all these images are very well taken care of, so we don't even think about them. And here we've got some clues, we've got lots of thought processes, there's bandage, there's a stethoscope, there's images behind which show dilemmas and, and almost torture going on, and the pose in the chair um, is obviously very uh, restrictive and distressing. So again, perfectly in line with the ideas in the statement. The attention to detail is, is obvious in a lot of these images and that, what, that adds another layer to our thought processes about what's happening. And here, for example, the, the mask of the mouth is a tape measure, which gives you all sorts of things to think about in relation to the statement and this particular image. Yeah, a strong graphic image with those gruesome faces um, surrounding that lady. Um, she's aspiring to something. Um, so again, very well constructed image, which gives us a lot of food for thought. Here again, the clues are, are working so that we can start to think about what this image might mean. We've got money masking the eyes and we've got dice in the, in the bubbles on, in the bath, as well as the gruesome um, effect of the slashed wrist. So, it's another example of how you can relate in a completely different way your image to your statement. And here again, we've got um, a puzzling image with lots to think about. It's, it's not in a studio setting. It's still set up. It's still perfectly staged. Um, and it has the same quality of light and style that all the other images do. It's amazing what you can say with not saying anything. Um, the fact they've got masked tape over their mouths, um, mm -hmm. coupled with the pictures of happy families on either side of them, um, 
it, it, it's such a powerful message of, about communication. At least that would be part of my reading of it. But again, there's lots for the viewer to think about and come to their own conclusion. And again, conflict, the, gra the graffiti at the back, um, illustrates violence, swords, angels, wings. There's an awful lot going on in this image, but the quality of the light on the eyes of the subject um, bring that to the foreground and masking it with black highlights them even more. So again, a very clever use of uh, the setup of the image. Well, Richard, that really was a fascinating panel. Uh, now, we should ask you, if we can go back to the hanging plan just for a moment, I'm sure everyone is thinking, can we see the hanging plan again? I'm sure everyone is thinking, which one is Elizabeth Cowell? She said she's got her own portrait in here. Which one is it? Can you reveal? I, that, that's, um, well, I, I, I should say the panel, when they're viewing this and assessing it, don't know. Um, but I've subsequently been told um, that the top left image is Elizabeth. Ah, image one. Image one. Very brave. But absolutely superb. It, it seems to have everything you're looking for at fellowship level in your genre. Yes. And if I could take a moment, it also illustrates that you have to understand yourself as a photographer when you do a fellowship particularly. Um, this panel required a lot of commitment and understanding of the issue, and it also required a huge amount of interpersonal skill. The idea of going to your work colleagues, colleagues and saying, oh, by the way, you mind revealing your innermost secrets to me so I can take your picture, um, is not a trivial task. I mean, I'm, I'm joking about it, but you can imagine the difficulty of having that discussion. So in this case, it was even more than just a photographic project. Yeah, she's done a fabulous job. So Elizabeth Carl and Richard Brayshaw, thank you very much indeed. Well, now we're open for questions. And so if we can bring all the chairs back in, please. Uh, also, Ben Fox, ARPS, the Senior Distinctions Assistant, is going to join us. So between us, we should be able to answer any questions you have. And they're coming in uh, thick and fast. Um, so uh, let's have a look at the first one. Um, Richard, let's go back to you, actually, because the first one's about a statement of intent. Does it have to be 150 words or 300 in your case, contemporary? Or can it just be a few lines? No, it, it, there isn't. You don't have to fill up the space, as it were. Um, our usual suggestion is that you keep it as simple and straightforward as you possibly can. Um, the only really real requirement is that you say enough for the panel to be able to consider the next criteria, which is a cohesive body of work that communicates the aims and objectives set out in the statement. So you just need to say enough so that the panel understand what you're trying to do. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, next question is, is it possible for a potential submission to cover more than one genre? Uh, maybe Simon Leach would like to talk about that. Is Simon with us? No, well, let's sorry, ask. Pete. Are you are there? Are sorry, you? Pete. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. I was confused. We, we, hear about, we hear about overlap between genres. Is it possible? Uh, the question is for a potential submission to cover more than one genre. Uh, I think so, yeah, always. Um, you know, the fellowship quality is probably easy to spot by any member of any assessment team. But obviously how you show your intent as the photographer, that comes through the statement of intent and, and how you direct the images in terms of the way they're laid out then that's obviously going to really put you into a genre position, uh, which would give you best chance of success. So I think this is why the RPS is so good at giving one-to-one -one, uh, offerings of advice and, and evenings like this evening to help you understand exactly where you best fit in terms of the project you're doing. So the statement of intent points the way quite clearly. Um, well, it thank certainly you introduces the way. Yeah, exactly. Um, Sue Brown, um, this question says, the majority of panels tonight have been monochrome. Is this typical for FRPS? Uh, no, I don't think it is. Um, it's been quite extraordinary. I would say that in fine art, we get a probably 50-50. 
And I think um, I heard Mick Durham say earlier that in um, nature, they're nearly always colour. So I think it's just been the way the dice has rolled this evening that we seem to have had a majority of black and white. Okay, thank you. Hazel, um, do I have to go abroad to create a travel panel? Absolutely not. I think the important thing is, um, is the passion and the understanding. Um, and it's very difficult to do that on a single trip um, because it's important that you've researched your, uh, your subject and you've had the ability to, to really understand it. And I think that can be quite difficult to do abroad um, unless you're planning to uh, go there repeatedly or spend a long time there like Max clearly did. Particularly at the moment, it might be easier to do one nearer one's home um, because of the limitations on travel itself. Travel is a sense of place, not yeah, where you, you go. And you can go back and back and back, can't you? Absolutely, uh, at different times of year and, uh, and um, be, a, be a part of that community. Okay, Mick, uh, this is for you. Uh, I've been taking images of bamboo in a natural wild landscape garden of six acres. They are mostly rare species. Does this qualify for the natural history genre? Right, this is, this is a tricky one because I've actually heard this question and I did a bit of research and I didn't know this, but apparently there are one or two um, bamboos growing in Britain which are naturalised and therefore have sort of become a wild plant within Britain. However, I think that if these bamboos have been imported from um, China, wherever, um, and are growing, maybe growing in a wild scenario, but they are very much a cultivated plant. They're sort of, it's a, it's a complex one, but I think the answer is probably no, they wouldn't, and they would perhaps have to be put into some other genre. Uh, yeah. Not trying to catch you out or anything, but when you see your prints of bamboo, how would you know? Well, obviously, um, we would be after a species list and <laughs> yeah. they would need to put the species. But this, of course, is where um, <clears throat> we're not all experts on everything, even within our own genre. And I have to be honest, there are subjects that come up and I have to take the photographer's word for it in terms of the species list and so on. But bamboo is one of those things that would make us perhaps think, oh, hang on a minute, is this really a, a wild plant? Is it really naturalised in Britain? Um, and therefore, we would perhaps question it. Well, we'll see if we get a bamboo submission anytime soon. <laughs> the next one to you as well, actually. I have a light trap to catch moths. Would these still be classed as wild and therefore suitable for your panel? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, they are wild because, of course, they are going to be let free and will return back to the wild. And in a way, uh, a moth trap is really a bit like putting up a bird feeder. It attracts that particular species into an area where you can photograph it. Um, they're not really captive, but it, it's a tricky one, that one, and uh, it would be obviously better if they could be photographed in situ where they actually live. But it, sometimes that's just not possible. And it would be a shame to, to um, exclude images of moths because of the way in which they were taken. OK, well, thank you for that. Let's go to Trevor Yerby now. Trevor, you've done quite a few of these one-to-one -one portfolio reviews via Zoom. And we've got a couple of questions. Can you first of all explain what actually happens uh, in these sessions? And secondly, this question says, am I at risk of being less successful if I don't have a one-to-one -one with the panel member? Uh, okay, well, that's uh, question one, Peter. Um, normally, um, an applicant, we get their information, we're asking them to send their panel of images to us about four or five days beforehand, we then arrange the Zoom meeting, we chat them through. What I feel, but then it's very personal, it's not necessarily what the panel feel, but it's my sort of view of where they're sitting, what the images are, we go through the images one by one, I will comment on them where I think they can be improved or they can be changed or the hanging plan can be changed. So it's a very uh, interactive uh, session. 
and I think a lot of people benefit greatly and they actually enjoy it because these they're so close to their own work that sometimes it needs an outsider to actually tell them and they suddenly say oh actually I didn't realize that was there or if I moved that from here to there it would make a better panel. So given the choice probably better to have one. Oh absolutely I think it's um it, it, it would help their success rate if they had a one-to-one -one with any of the, the panel members or chairs, definitely. Okay, thank you, thank you. So Ben Fox, let's bring you in now. This question says, can the mounting of printed images be, in inverted commas, individually created, and can mounts be prepared commercially? Um, yes and yes. Uh, commercial um, mounts can be used, not a problem. Um, and the individual mounts, they could be creatively produced. Um, the question is, does it work? Does it work with the image? And that will be a question that the uh, panel members would um, have to answer when it comes through in, in front of them. Okie dokie. The next one also for you. Do you need to have a different theme between associate and fellowship? Different subject matter. Okay. So in fact, I've had a couple of emails recently about this. It's, it's not a different theme. It could be something you've progressed in. We would like to see the progression from what level, be it associate to the fellowship. Um, and also the kind of the maturity of that body of work to progress. So the theme, the approach could be very similar but we would like to see progression within that work. Okie dokie. Um, Simon Leach, does documentary need to have an end purpose? No, that's a play. I think the, the well, the, not, not in those terms. There is a specific end purpose because obviously you're trying to tell a story, but um, so you are shooting it for a reason, but it's not an end purpose in the same reason that applied would be. It doesn't have to be intended for a book or an exhibition or anything like that. It can just be shot as a documentary for uh, submission to the Royal Photographic Society or, or for any other personal piece you've got. Okay, thank you. And let's end now with another one for Ben Fox. I've heard there's going to be a photo book panel soon. When will it be a very, a, around? Well, I'm hoping um, we could get the criteria and requirements and the guidelines out by the end of the year um, and we'd also release that in advance of actually having the assessment so everybody knows where we're coming from and the applicants can work on their submissions until that point so that will probably be six months after the announcement of the criteria and guidelines and requirements. So but, hopefully uh, late spring that sort of time for the assessment. Good to see the books be exciting, uh, new category, new genre for us at the uh, RPS. Okay, well, we'll wait to hear that. Well, that's all we have time for. So I'd like to thank all the panel chairs and the applicants who came to talk to us. And of course, Ben Fox and Simon Verko and Stuart Wall, who's putting in the images and everything. So it's been a big production. This is our last roadshow. So thank you to everyone who's taken part in them. We hope you've enjoyed them and that it may have spurred you on to taking a distinction yourself and don't forget help is always available if you email distinctions at rps.org and you've heard all about the portfolio reviews so coming up the autumn season of distinction talks starting with jane hilton frps a brilliant documentary photographer and filmmaker and we'll be talking about brothels in america strange weddings and the english at play that's Thursday, the 24th of September at 1900 BST. Do join us then if you can. But for now, goodbye from us all here at the Royal Photographic Society. And thank you for participating.